So I have a question for you guys. Um, how many of you have passed gas today? <laughs> You're not supposed to raise your hands. No, I'm kidding. Okay. So the reason I ask that question is those of you who have either had surgery or, or had a loved one who has, who've has, who's had surgery know that that's one of the questions we doctors ask first thing in the morning. You know, they wake you up, you're groggy. Did you pass gas? Um, and the reason for that is not an obsession with flatulence. <laughs> the reason for that is that that simple, honest question tells us about a much more complex phenomena, which is the health of your d digestive system, right? For about a decade or so, I've been working on a complex problem. Uh, some would say impossible, which is bringing reliable laboratory diagnosis to poor countries. Um, we have different governments, different regulations, different people. We got corruption, we got attitude, we got everything. But what I've learned is that the only way we could make any headway in this morass is by asking simple questions and following them and seeing where they lead. In 2011, we collaborated with the Ministry of Health in Uganda to answer a simple question. And the question is, was what is the state of laboratories in Kampala? At the time, we picked Uganda because it was, if you had a list of the countries in Africa ranked by per capita incomes, Uganda was smack in the middle. And so we had this question, what was the state of, 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 of labs in Kampala? And we wanted to know how many labs there were, how were the services paid for, and what was the quality of their work? Now, for those of you that don't know, Uganda is a country in East Africa, and Kampala is its capital. It's a city of 1.5 million people close to the shores of Lake Victoria. If you look at Kampala from a distance or at night, it's a beautiful city, and it could be anywhere else in the world. However, once you go in close, you realize it's a, it's a bustling mass of activity and humanity and energy. And we realized very quickly that a lot of the labs we were trying to find would be on streets like this without a name, and they would be hard to identify. Or they would be on the back of somebody's house. And so we realized the only way we could find these laboratories was to do the survey in person and mostly on foot. So, we got 23 people, and over three weeks we covered the city, and we found 957 laboratories doing 14,000 tests. This was way beyond anything that I had expected we would find. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, what this number suggests is that Kampala, at the time, had the same number of laboratories per capita as the United States. Okay, think about that for a minute. It's amazing. And the second question is, how were these laboratories being paid for? It turns out 96% of them were in the private sector, so they were being supported by out-of-pocket payments. So this is, for those of you that are interested in development work or do development work, you know this is the holy grail of development work. You want a local industry that is financially self-sufficient. However, when we asked about quality, what we saw was that only 5% of the laboratories met the lowest quality standards of the local region. So at this point, we had figured out some pretty basic questions about this, the state of labs in Kampala and much of Sub-Saharan Africa. But we're still left with a question, which was, how could people access the higher quality laboratories? And this is a real problem, especially in rural areas. To illustrate, I'll pick an example from Western Kenya. This building is a building that was donated by the World Bank, and it's in Western Kenya. And inside this building is, is quite a nice lab that was also supported by, by the World Bank. And the idea was to place this building in the center of this district. It's the, it's the blue icon you see in the middle. And it's supposed to support the 45 clinics that are spread around in the district. Great idea. The problem is some of these clinics are up to 40 miles away, and almost all of them are on dirt roads like this. And so when you have months and months and months of, of rainy season, these roads are impassable or at best unpredictable. And so 
you have two problems. You have a white elephant laboratory that was, that was that where the money is now wasted, and then you have patients who can't get uh, the answers they need. This brought us to a next, the next question. And that question was, is there a way we can move laboratory samples from clinics to labs that doesn't depend on roads? And the answer we came up with was drones. Drones are small, unmanned aerial vehicles um, that fly, obviously, so they don't need roads. <laughs> um, but blood specimens, biological specimens, laboratory specimens are not like a book or a shoe, meaning they're not robust enough to be transported anyway. For each mode of transportation you consider, you have to you have to vet it to make sure that that mode of transportation doesn't destroy the blood sample. So to answer this question, can drones be used for routine transport of laboratory specimen? We did an experiment. We, we got several hundred uh, paired blood samples from healthy volunteers. And we drove all the, all the specimens to a, a flight field about an hour north of Baltimore City and took half the specimen, one, one set of the pairs, and packaged them as you see, put them in a drone, and then uh, we flew them around and around and around and around and around for up to 40 minutes. And once the samples came back and took them back to the laboratory and did a battery of 33 tests on both the samples that had flown and the ones that had not flown. And what we found were that the results were the same. So it's great. So this, this was a green light for the idea that we could use drones to transport laboratory specimens. However, it doesn't address the issues of regulation. Most countries in the world have no regulation about drone transport, so it's a non-starter. And it also doesn't address the issues of public acceptance. However, um, change happens fastest now. Um, if you look at the cell phone revolution in much of the developing world, it's a classic example of this. So I'm optimistic. Um, I don't know that drones will be the answer to the problem of diagnosis in poor countries, but I know that if we hadn't started attacking this complex problem by using questions, we would never have figured out that the problem with laboratories in Sub-Saharan Africa was not one of quantity, but rather one of quality. And we wouldn't have figured out that what was needed was not more, more donations or stuff, but better trained staff and support. I've learned that every time I approach a complex problem with a question, a simple, honest question, the answers are always better and more beautiful than I could have come up with. Thank you.